Sustainable Development. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the organizing committee, I warmly welcome all the guests and invitees at this unique gathering. I also warmly welcome with respect the panel of judges of the session. A word of kind greetings to senior and junior academics, military officers, presenting authors, students, and also all conference delegates present in the audience. Before commencing the session's proceedings, ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the university anthem. Many of many of our guests, please see. How many of you please be seated? To start the session's proceedings, I cordially invite the chairperson of the session, Prof. Shani Rangu, accompanied by the rapporteur, Dr. H. P. M. Dabare, to take their seat. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have the honor of inviting with respect Surgeon Captain N.R.P. Pereira, the Dean, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, Consultant Surgical Oncologist, Senior Lecturer in Surgery, Surgeon Captain Sri Lanka Navy, to formally introduce the chairperson of this session, Professor Shani Rodrigo. Thank you. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm warmly welcome you to the second session now. Technical sessions of KDIRC 2022. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Ishani Toyza. Ishani Prabhu, Professor Pediatrics. And she is a Bachelor of Medicine by Dr. Sajri from the University of Colombo, has completed her MD in Pediatrics and also completed a PhD from Oxford University in Medical Education, I believe, and in many awards and, you know, received to her presentations and things, as well as she received the Commonwealth Academic Scholarship awarded to Commonwealth Scholarship Commission, Association of Commonwealth Universities, University of Oxford. And her research and interest, research interests are neonatology, pediatric and nutrition, and obesity in children. And she has many publications and presentations in national and international conferences. And I want to welcome you and start the session. Thank you very much, Professor Shani. Uh, surgeons actually get mixed up, no? <laughs> Excuse. Okay, so um, uh, at the outset, thank you very much, the Department of Physiotherapy, um, for the Development Sciences for inviting me to chair this session. And I think from the um, day I joined KU, I have been sort of closely working with the Life Health Sciences people, especially in physiotherapy, and I have actually supervised many of the student research projects, so it gives me great pleasure to chair this session. Um, so if we get on to the practicality, that there are six papers in this session. Um, each each paper will be given 12 minutes. At the end of 10 minutes, um, there will be one bell round and two at 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and then we'll have three minutes for discussion. So uh, we'll take questions at the end of each paper because these are separate papers and uh, I think it's much better to do it that way. And, uh, so without wasting too much time, let's start with the first paper. First paper of the day is a validation study to evaluate the accuracy of the beep. You were going to introduce the judges. Yeah, okay. So the judging will be done by, um, we have a panel of three eminent judges for the papers. Dr. Suramika Vadibudupidia, who is the head and senior lecturer, Department of Physiotherapy, Farm Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, University of Philadelphia, to come. Dr. Asha Vindasingha, senior lecturer, Department of Allied Health Sciences, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. And Dr. Sachitra Ilangantilaka, senior lecturer in medicine from our university, who is a consultant in pneumatology and rehabilitation. So, 
thank you very much for agreeing to, agree to uh, judge this paper. So the first paper is going to be presented by BHS Gunaratna. It's uh, on a validation study to evaluate the accuracy of the beep test in measuring cardiopulmonary endurance using maximum oxygen uptake as the gold standard. So um, I invite BHS Gunaratna to uh, present his paper. Stroke rate 
so uh, we could not, uh, after that, uh, we applied the ECG strips over the bricks in the correct position uh, to track the uh, cardiovascular uh, response. Uh, uh, and uh, we put on the CPET mask to the uh, players uh, to uh, calculate or the, to measure the real-time oxygen uh, uptake by the gas analyzer, break-to-break uh, -break gas analyzer. So uh, uh, the inclination uh, of the, basically the inclination of the ergometer uh, increase to uh, create resistance. So uh, for females, it was about uh, 30 watt per each two minutes, and for males, it was about uh, uh, 50 watt for uh, each one minute. So the, the players were encouraged to uh, achieve their maximum effort to achieve the maximum uh, oxygen uptake to, uh, in order to get uh, the most accurate VO2 max uh, value at, uh, possible. So, uh, after that, uh, uh, after the uh, CPET uh, testing procedure, we gave them a uh, uh, three hour, uh, sorry, three days uh, rest. Uh, after the recovery, we uh, conducted the test and uh, we calculated the uh, VO2 max values from the deep test. So, then we uh, compared the uh, gold standard method and the deep test. So, uh, based on our results, uh, when talking about, about uh, the demographic characteristics of study population, the uh, entire, for the entire sample, the, the average BMI was 22.77 kilogram uh, square meter. And uh, for males, it was uh, 23.07. And for females, it was uh, 22.12. And uh, our primary uh, objective was uh, the measure uh, the VO2 max uh, values from the uh, CPET gold standard method and the beep test. So for the entire sample, uh, the value of VO2 max, uh, uh, got, we got value of VO2 max from the CPET was uh, 33.64. And for beep test, uh, it was uh, 49.26 milliliter per kilogram per minute. And uh, when uh, talking uh, it, uh, with gender wise, for males, uh, uh, for, from the gold standard CPET method, 33.01. And uh, for beep test, uh, 50.75. For females, uh, uh, VO2 max value got from the uh, CPET, 33.64. And for beep test, 45.99 milliliter kilogram per minute. So uh, we found uh, the bias or error uh, uh, when comparing the test and gold standard method. So uh, we found overestimation, overestimated beep test values uh, against the gold standard CPET method. So uh, for the total sample, it was about uh, 15.62, uh, and for males, it was about 17.74, and for females, it was about 12.35. So um, if you take it as a uh, percentage deviation or the uh, uh, overestimated uh, option as a percentage. Uh, for males, it was 33.7%, uh, and for females, it was about 26.8%. Uh, uh, in uh, males, uh, the overestimation is more than females. So, we concluded that beep test uh, is uh, significantly uh, overestimated the VO2 max uh, when compared to the gold standard CPET method. Uh, relevant uh, percentage by gender. So uh, we concluded that the cardiorespiratory uh, uh, endurance, uh, we found that the uh, cardiorespiratory endurance measured by the beep test and CPET were higher among the male rovers compared to the female. So based on our findings, we recommend that uh, uh, to use a beep test as a field test, but with cautions. Uh, the beep test can be used, estimated VO2 max by correcting the overestimation for the each gender. Uh, or the, uh, we can deduct the percentage uh, by gender. So, 
we recommend that uh, for future studies, uh, the, repeat, the present study uh, required to validate the different equations to use the uh, estimate the VO2 max by the beam test. And I would uh, like to thank all the participants of the National Logging Pool of Sri Lanka and the Vice Chancellor of the General Surgeon of the Defense University and Dean of Allied Health Science. And uh, the special thanks goes to the Director of Institute of Sports, Dr. Lal Lekanayaka, uh, and the Roving Federation and the medical officers and other staffs uh, in the Institute of Sports Medicine. And especially uh, our supervisors, Dr. Samira Sienanayaka and Dr. Prasangi Dabare, and the academic staff of the Department of Physiotherapy, KD. So these are uh, my references. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Um, uh, before taking questions, because I'm ignorant, I'm asking, what is this beam test? Uh, beam test is the indirect field method to measuring cardiorespiratory and uh, The gold standard method is CPEP. So, uh, so you don't need any specialized equipment for that? No, no any specialized equipment. Uh, it can uh, perform as a team, uh, so time consuming. So the, the higher value means higher endurance, is it? Uh, it is uh, not, uh, it's not depend on only the automat. It's a uh, one indicator for measuring cardiovascular endurance. Thank you for that explanation. The paper is open for discussion. We have what three minutes for questions. Uh, I have two questions. One, uh, why do you choose rollers uh, in your study? And do you think this uh, is over, you know, you have come to a conclusion that it significantly overestimated the beam test. Do you think it will vary from sport to sport? Uh, we chose rovers uh, because uh, rowing is the uh, uh, high, highly demand aerobic capacity, highly demand sports than other sports. So we chose rovers uh, because uh, we, ought, uh, we, thought, uh, we can get accurate uh, VO2 max uh, values from the rovers, so we choose that. Uh, according to the sport, uh, VO2 max uh, differ from the sport, and uh, each individual, uh, the uh, other fitness parameters uh, depend on the cardiovascular endurance, and it will differ among other sports. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, did you um, I mean, search for standard VO2 max values like for this particular age group or like for Asians? Uh, you know, yeah, so uh, how like is it the same uh, VO2 max uh, values that you got in this population or it is other than lesser than them? Or, uh, South Asian athletes uh, VO2 max uh, levels uh, are more, more similar to our Sri Lankan uh, robbers, growing population, but according to the ethnicity, uh, the VO2 max levels are deeper. Okay. Uh, see, the other question I have is uh, the beep test is a, a, a calculation method. No? So, what are the things that you are, what are the parameters? You are taking to calculate the VO2 max in beep test? Uh, we took the total shuttles uh, they completed during the uh, test, testing procedure and uh, we apply the uh, e apply equation uh, to total, total shuttle sound. Okay, so it doesn't have a, like, uh, I mean, uh, a certain VO2 max calculation uh, methods are there, like for females, we have to add a particular. Um, value and for males a particular value. So in this beep test, uh, you don't have like as such uh, um, males and females uh, different way of calculating, no? Uh, the same way uh, we calculated the uh, both beep test, uh, um, which uh, we uh, consider the uh, completed total shuttles during the test for 20 meters. Okay. So um, this. Uh, CPET is uh, giving the direct VO2 yes. max value without uh, involving it in calculations. Yes. The most accurate uh, value, gold standard method is CPET method. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Uh, this is consisting of three types of exercises 
adaptation, also called permanent gaze stabilization, habituation exercises, as well as balanced training exercises. Uh, to assess the severity of the handicap, we used a self-inventory questionnaire that is called the Dizziness Handicap Inventory. And this, is, this was created by Jacobson and Newman. And this was the mostly used patient reported outcome measurement in clinical vestibular research. And this uh, questionnaire consisting of 25 questions altogether, uh, with seven physical questions, nine functional questions, and nine emotional questions. So each and every question they have allocated some marks and altogether the total score is 100. Looking on to the justification, so when we search of the literature, uh, we found out that the most uh, modifiable risk factor, most of modifiable risk factors were false was vertigo and dizziness. And also the patients who are suffering with these two symptoms have low balance confidence, functional limitation, uh, associated anxiety and depression as well as they have a participation restriction so uh, for the any other social activities and uh, also this uh, when we search of the literature in Sri Lanka there was no any studies done on this field uh, on vestibular physiotherapy to find the effectiveness for the BPP patients so these reasons tend us to uh, go through this pathway for our research study. So our objectives, the main objective was to assess the changes of the DHI score after the combined treatment of the vestibular physiotherapy added to vestibular sedatives and uh, after the treatment of vestibular sedatives only because we have two groups and to compare the two groups for the improvement of the DHI score. Uh, focusing on the methodology, so our study design was a quasi-experimental study and we used the EAP departments of the National Hospital Sri Lanka and University Hospital KDU. And uh, our study population were BPPV patients with residual dizziness that diagnosed the disorder uh, within the last three months. And uh, this, population, this population included uh, all males and females within the age range of 18 to 75. And, uh, who are presented the symptoms, that means who have the residual dizziness. And we excluded the participants uh, who are pregnant and uh, uh, the patients who have the same types of symptoms but due to other neuromuscular conditions. And altogether, uh, our study sample was 48. And uh, we divided these two, four, these uh, 48 participants into two main groups called group A and group B. Uh, for equally by alternative sampling method. Uh, group A, they only followed with vestibular sedative treatments that was prescribed by the physicians. And group B, they followed a combined treatment, which is uh, a collection of vestibular physiotherapy that was prescribed by the physiotherapist and the vestibular sedatives that was prescribed by the phys physicians. So all the 48 participants were followed the same vestibular sedatives, the same dose, same frequency. Uh, when we talk about the vestibular physiotherapy exercises, only B, group B participants received this uh, physiotherapy exercises. And uh, in this image, you can see the sample of three set of exercises that we done. And uh, these three types, habituation, also called as, uh, sorry, habituation, this habituation exercises, uh, mainly focuses on the head movements and the trunk movements of the patient. And gaze yes, stabilization, this is focuses on the ocular movements or the eye movements of the patient. And the balance training, we focuses on the static and dynamic balance of the participants. So all the participants who received the vestibular uh, physiotherapy exercises were instructed to carry out these exercises twice a day. And these exercises were prescribed, updated, and uh, checked by the physiotherapist. Data collection. So we took the ethical approval from the uh, ethical review of committee uh, KDU. And uh, to collect the demographic characteristics of the participants, we used a self-administered questionnaire. And uh, to measure the, to check the severity of the handicap, as I mentioned earlier, we used the dizziness handicap inventory. 
and we took follow-ups after two weeks and after four weeks of the baseline assessment. Moving on to the results, so we uh, analyzed our data statistically by using IBM uh, CSS software version 20 and uh, when considering about the study population, uh, there were females and males in the age range of 30 to 75. The mean age of participants in group A and group B were uh, similar, very similar. So we have no any contrasting characteristics about the age. And when considering the gender, as you can see in these two pie charts in group A and group B, uh, there were more female population than the male population as as we uh, found out from the literature. Uh, this DPTV condition is more prevalent in female population than male population. And uh, the mean DHI scores of group A and group B, in the commencement it was similar and after four weeks uh, the mean difference was 24.83 in group A and 31.08 in group B. Uh, the improvement of the physical subscale uh, in group A after four weeks of the treatment it was 6.92 and group B it was 5.90. Uh, within the group improvement also we checked and uh, in both the groups uh, we observed uh, improvement but in group A it was the, the mean difference was uh, 24.83 and in group B it was more it was 3.31.08. Moving on to the discussion, so when, when we checked about the two groups, group A and B, there was no any contrasting characteristics at the beginning of the study and uh, uh, statistically significance was observed within the group improvement in both group A and both group, uh, both group A and B in terms of total DHI and their subscales uh, and also we observed the significant mean improvement in DHI in group B greater than group A. And this result was also proven by these two similar studies uh, that was done in 1990 and 2009. And also we uh, found out that this, there was a statistically significant difference between the improvement of the physical subscale in DHI. And also a similar result was found in this study uh, which was done in 2007. And also we uh, found out that the combined treatment uh, is very effective than the sedatives alone. So this result also proven by two similar studies that was done in 2010 and 2021. So uh, our final conclusion, uh, the main conclusion of our study was the combined treatment of vestibular physiotherapy added to vestibular sedatives can improve the residual symptoms and uh, thereby improving the quality of life as well as uh, we can conclude that this combined treatment can improve the uh, patient's physical, emotional and functional handicap uh, by reducing the residual dizziness of the participants with BPPD. Uh, recommendations uh, for the physiotherapist and the healthcare professional, uh, I would like to recommend it is better to hand out a printed guide uh, for exercises and also it is better to educate even one me family member uh, and also it is better to conduct group sessions uh, other than uh, having a solo session for the vestibular physiotherapy and uh, for the future res researchers I would like to recommend uh, to use a group uh, that follows only vestibular physiotherapy and uh, it is better to assess the effectiveness of vestibular physiotherapy uh, for conditions other than DPPD. And these are some of our references. And finally, uh, our heartful gratitude to the participants of the study who offered their valuable time. And my sincere thanks to the Department of EAT uh, in National Hospital Sri Lanka and University Hospital KDU who gave their kind and voluntary support for our research. And my deepest appreciation for our supervisors for guiding us throughout the project. Thank you. Thank you, Sajid. Thank you for that interesting presentation. Um, can I open the paper for discussion? Certainly, the, the scale that you used to assess the disability was it validated? You used a similar question? Yes, yes, similar version. It was validated. 
So any any particular studies that has been done? So how much do you know? Thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, just uh, a suggestion for your future works. Uh, like uh, your age range is uh, between uh, 30 to 75 years, and uh, if you can go for a subgroup analysis of, uh, I mean, breaking the uh, like age ranges into like 30 to 45, sort of, uh, because uh, uh, your results can further be uh, influenced by the. Uh, uh, I don't know whether it will be like uh, depends on the age of the patients, uh, the improvement, the I mean the degree of uh, recovery. So just a suggestion for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the nice presentation. I have the same comment, and uh, because uh, uh, participants uh, age group were 30 to 75, so uh, about 60 or 65, there is a tendency of uh, decrease in the balance uh, due to the age. So uh, I also recommend uh, if you can limit the age uh, up to 60 or 65 or uh, subgroup analysis is uh, better than this uh, uh, analysis. And uh, the other thing is, can I know how you ensure the safety of the patient's technique when you conduct the exercise sessions? Uh, uh, the exercises were prescribed by the physiotherapist and uh, she instructed the patients and also she uh, checked whether the patient is safe or not. So, and also we were there uh, observing. Uh, this regarding the exercises, the rehabilitation plan you have implemented here. So what was the reference for that exercise that you have selected for you know, the vestibular rehabilitation exercise? Yes. Uh, so this exercise protocol, this was not created by us. Yes. This is the same protocol that was functioning in the uh, National Hospital Sri Lanka. Because we didn't uh, create the same uh, protocol by us. Yes. Because it will be an experimental study if we done like this. Uh, did you refer any past studies that have followed the same type of exercise Yes, protocol? sir. Yes. Based on that, you have yes. designed your exercise yes. protocol. You're welcome. Thank you. So this is a case control like study, isn't it? You have a control group. So what do you mean by quasi-experimental study? Uh, quasi-experimental study, that is uh, uh, where the pre-existing uh, or treatments are done in the setting and we are only checking the uh, tree, uh, improvement of the participants in two groups uh, without uh, creating a new type of treatment. So it's, you're observing the intervention? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one other question. Uh, how did you allocate the patients to the groups? Is there any method you follow? Good groups? Yes. Who pay anything? As we recommend. Okay. Uh, it, this, uh, when the patient is coming again, so they are given a day. No, I mean, uh, how did you recommend? Group A and B, yes. alternatively. Alternatively, yes. Not randomly. No. Okay, thank you. So, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Sachin Tani, for that interesting presentation. The so, next paper is the association between body mass index and lumbar lordosis angle among patients with chronic low back pain in selected teaching hospitals within Kalamu district, Sri Lanka. The paper uh, will be presented by BARP Gatanayan. Uh, very good morning to all the delegates who have participated to KDIRC 2022 of Remitas uh, My study is the association between body mass index and lumbar lordosis angle among patients with chronic low back pain in selected teaching hospitals within Colombo district, Sri Lanka. This is the outline of my presentation. Uh, let's move on to the introduction. Uh, before I start the presentation, I would like to introduce the terms low back pain, what is low back pain and what is chronic low back pain. 
First, the locate pain. Locate pain is the pain and discomfort uh, localized below the causal margin and above the inferior cruel falls with or without a leg pain, preferred leg pain. And chronic low back pain is the low back pain that exp experiences for longer than 12 weeks. Uh, basically, low back pain affects uh, the patient's lumbar curvature, posture, and activities of daily living. Uh, according to the report uh, published in 2014, that's the uh, glo global burden of diseases, uh, chronic, uh, the low back pain has been identified as the greatest factor of causing disability, and it is ranked in terms of overall burden. And uh, low back pain can generate anxiety of movement and thereby it involves in the uh, movement avoidance of the patients and then in conditioning. Uh, then results further increasing problems related to activities of daily living, work activity and sexual function. Uh, then in posture, uh, low back pain affects the posture that characterized by slight adjustment of the spinal curvatures on the sagittal plane. Uh, the lumbar curvature, that means uh, lumbar lordosis can be identified as the angle between the upper plane of L1 lumbar vertebrae and the upper plane of S1 sacral vertebrae. The normal values of the uh, lumbar lordosis uh, is 20 to 45 and the hyperlordosis is below 20 degrees and hyperlordosis that is more than 45 degrees. Uh, actually, the lumbar curvature, the lumbar lordosis acts as a bridge that transfers forces from upper body to the lower uh, This slide shows uh, three of our patients who presented with hyperlordosis, hypolordosis and normal lumbar lordosis. Uh, BMI is a common index used to classify individuals depending on their body build. And this table one shows the BMI values according to Asian and global classification system. In our study, we focus on the Asian classification system. Uh, as chronic low back pain is one of the most common musculoskeletal problems present in the present world, and about 70 to 80 percent adult population experience it at any time in their lives. So it is important to figure out how BMI and lumbar lordosis associate with each other in chronic low back pain patients. Uh, this is our objective to investigate the association between body mass index and lumbar lordosis angle among patients with chronic low back pain uh, in selected patient hospitals within Kalama District, Shinoka. Uh, our study is a our study was a cross-sectional study, and the sample size comprised of uh, 2012 uh, chronic low back pain patients at National Hospital of Sri Lanka, Shidavalan Kuchanar Hospital, and University Hospital of Kotla Defense University. And our study included male and female uh, chronic low back pain patients aged between 20 to 60 years. And we excluded patients presented with acute or subacute low back pain, neoplasms, congenital deformities, and partial deformities. And patients who had undergone any surgeries of the torso, fractures of the torso. And further, patients who have a history of degenerative conditions that is based on uh, the diagnosis card of the patient and pregnant women. Uh, the ethical clearance for our study was obtained from General Sir John Kudra Defense University, National Hospital of Sri Lanka, Sridhar General Hospital, and uh, University Hospital, Kudra Defense University. And pre testing was done, including five randomly selected patients with chronic low back pain via the proper data collection. And our data collection is done at three separately designed stations. The station one was responsible for taking demographic data, height and weight of the participants. And station two was responsible for calibration of the uh, dual thoracic vertebrae and anterior superior iliac spine. And, and also marking the vertebrae and right ASIS using adhesive markers. The station three was responsible for photographing and measuring in the day using Kynolia computer software. Uh, this shows our results. So table two shows the general characteristics of the study population. They are the mean values of the weight, height, age, body mass index, lumbar lordosis angle were given. Uh, table three shows the distribution of BMI in different age ranges. Uh, body mass index is analyzed using descriptive statistics. 
and majority of both female and male patients were belong to age category of 51 to 60 years and finality were belong to 20 to 30 years. And table 4 shows the distribution of laminologist angles in different age ranges. The female population has presented with higher mean values for LLA compared to male population and the highest mean LLA of females was uh, 42.36 degrees and the lowest was 33.29 degrees. The highest and the lowest mean LLA values of male were 34.21 34 and uh, uh, 29.40 degrees respectively. Uh, table 5 shows the BMI classification of the our study population. The BMI was classified into underweight, normal and overweight and obese. Majority of female, that means 54% and male, about 35% patients who belong to category of obese. The lowest number of participants were included in the category of underweight, whereas females were 4% and males were 9%. Table 6 shows the LLA classification of the study population. Uh, Laparoid angle was classified into hypolodosis, normal lordosis and hyperlodosis. The majority of female, that means 60%, and male, that means 82% participants who belong to normal lordosis, while the minority of females, that means 2%, and males, about 7%, who are in the category of hypolodosis. According to Pearson test, a significant positive correlation is observed between lordosis angle and BMI. So here is our discussion. Uh, in the studies done previously, the lumbar load, normal lumbar load is given as a range that means about that means from 20 to 45 degrees. Uh, in the study published in 2021, and uh, as a respective number that that was about uh, 37.2 plus or minus 9.8. That was uh, according to our research study in 2016, depending on uh, a Nigerian population. In our uh, study the LLAs uh, the values were in males 32.58 and female 39.31. Uh, in both in our present study and the study published in 2040, uh, male number of angle was uh, higher compared to that of male. The female number of is higher compared to that of pardon. Uh, in, in male and female population, uh, with the increase of age, that increases the uh, laboratory's angle in our study, but contrast results were observed in the study presented in published in 2014. And male and female population, the age increases with the increase of BMI. The similar results were observed in the study published in 2006. The reasons could be uh, due to the majority of the population in other study, they were male, female, overweight and obese, and belong to age category 51 to 60 years. And majority of the male population that was that were overweight and obese in the present study. Uh, let's go on about conclusion. Uh, a significant association was observed between LLA and BMI in chronic low back pain patients. With the increase of BMI, it increases the lumbar lordosis. So we would like to recommend this as this is the first ever research done in Sri Lanka and very few number of researchers done respect to this study field. We would like to recommend further studies to compare the results of the present study and awareness programs could be conducted for the patients at orthopedic and neurological clinics as we, we were able to observe there is a direct relationship between BMI and laboratorism angle and also the BMI is greatly influencing on patients conditions like low back pain. So these are my references. And I would like to give my sincere regards to participants of this study, the Department of Physiotherapy staff at National Hospital of Sri Lanka, Shijawada Hospital, and University Hospital of Kutlaadi University, 
who gave their kind of voluntary support for this research. And also, it's, I would like to give my heartiest uh, thanks for supervisors and the team, the Faculty of Allied Sciences, staff of the Department of Physiotherapy and Health. Thank you for listening.
the next paper is a case control study on the association between disability due to low back pain and baby flow dysfunction among three to six month postpartum women. The paper is being presented by SK Vijay Dhrupa. Very good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm Ketiki Veer Surya and I'm here to present the, uh, our research, which is a case control study on the association between disability due to low back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction among three to six months postpartum women. So, uh, women, when uh, after childbirth, they actually go through, like, undergo a certain set of uh, physiological, psychological, and social changes in their postpartum period. And this can be obviously very challenging for many of them. And on the other hand, back pain is one of the most encountered uh, conditions or clinical presentations that we uh, see in um, uh, hospitals, okay? So, uh, considering that, uh, lower back pain can be actually uh, introduced uh, or defined as uh, any pain localized to the posterior aspect of the body below the costal margins and above the inferior gluteal pores with or without sciatica. Uh, pelvic floor dysfunction can be, uh, uh, can be introduced as a, a broad constellation of symptoms and anatomical changes uh, that, that uh, can affect the uh, normal uh, function of the pelvic floor. Uh, that can lead to, uh, uh, that usually clinically manifest as uh, urological, gynecological, or colorectal uh, symptoms, uh, which are usually interrelated, and uh, these uh, uh, and these clinical aspects, uh, this uh, the, the weakened pelvic floor can be like uh, seen as a, a fecal or urinary incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse. So uh, basically, uh, people with uh, postpartum lower back pain, uh, the, the postpartum lower back pain can usually uh, last up to six months, but it can also last up to decades sometimes. Uh, so these people tend to uh, develop this chronic lower back pain and disabilities like uh, activity limitations and participation restrictions in their lives. So it can be very challenging as well as uh, very uh, depressive for these people, for the women who undergo this uh, condition. So the coexisting nature of uh, disability to lower back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction has been very well established in uh, literature considering Western population. But uh, considering the Sri Lankan population, no researchers were found. So therefore, we focused on uh, conducting the research to find out uh, the association between these two. So main objective was to assess the association between disability due to lower back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction among three to six months postpartum women attending MH clinics in Jishri Jarakalpur Municipal Council area. So uh, uh, the methodology, uh, the study design was a case control study. Uh, the study was carried out in MOI clinics in Sri Jarabhulpur Municipal Council area with the participation of uh, three to six months postpartum women who were attending to those clinics. And our sample size was uh, 132 participants. And the sampling method we used for this was not properly convenient sampling. So this diagram shows uh, how we recruited our participants, the process of recruiting the participants. So uh, we have these three to six months postpartum women attending to the MR clinics in this area, and we had to exclude certain uh, participants, uh, like women who did not grant uh, proper consent or previous trauma, back injury in previous 12 months, and uh, spinal and back surgery uh, in previous 12 months, and women with structural anomalies. After excluding them, the selected participants were uh, basically uh, assigned into two groups, cases and controls, the case to control ratio was 1 to 2. The control group consisted of uh, uh, postpartum 3 to 6 months uh, women with without lower back pain. And the case group had uh, 44 participants and control group had 88 participants. Uh, case group included uh, postpartum uh, 3 to 6 months from labor and they had continuous or intermittent non-specific lower back pain for more than a week. 
and the other thing is they had pain. Uh, they recorded a pain of pain greater than zero in the numerical pain rating scale. So prior to the data collection, we uh, we obtained the ethical approvals from approval from KDUIC first, and then from the RDHS Colombo. And the socio-demographic data was collected uh, using the general questionnaire, which was uh, uh, validated and pre-tested uh, prior to the administration. And the level of pelvic dysfunction was measured using uh, pelvic floor disability index 20, which is also known as PFDI 20. Level of disability uh, due to lower back pain was measured using the Oxford disability index. These two questionnaires are internationally standardized and validated to Sri Lankan community so that we could use them uh, without any issue. So moving on to the SARS, uh, to the statistical analysis, we use SPSS uh, software, IBM SPSS software, the version 21. The age range of the case group was uh, 19 to 43 years and in the control group it was 18 to 41 years. As shown is in, this, uh, in this table, uh, you, you can see the uh, ODI score and PFDI score, the association. So the uh, we conducted uh, a descriptive analysis for the uh, uh, for the data set, and also we conducted the uh, Shapiroville test to test the normality of the distribution. So that we found uh, the data set was not normally distributed. So that we have to go for the non-parametric uh, test. In this case scenario, it was the Spearman's uh, correlation test. So, uh, using this PMS uh, relation test, the p value you can now see, p value is less than 0 0.05. Therefore, therefore, it can be reason that there is an association between disability due to lower back pain and pelvic uh, dysfunction symptom among the sample. Also, uh, the correlation coefficient or the R uh, between the ODI and PFDI scores are. 0.731, which suggests a strong positive relationship between the disability due to lower back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction in this uh, sample. This scatter plot shows the correlation between ODI and PFDI scores. So, uh, according to our research, we can come to like the, the conclusion of like we have a strong positive association between disability due to lower back pain and pelvic floor muscle dysfunction in this. Uh, in this sample, this study definitively proved that uh, the presence of a relationship between disability due to lower back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction in postpartum women. The cooperative nature of uh, pelvic floor dysfunction and lower back pain and uh, its related uh, disabilities have been investigated in previous studies as well, as I have mentioned here. Uh, Kim et al. have done a, conducted the study in 2010. They have got the R or correlation coefficient of 0 0.70, which is very close to our result as well. And uh, in 2017, Prokat and colleagues uh, conducted another research, which, uh, which was a similar research, and uh, they have a co correlation coefficient of uh, 0.511. So, uh, the disability uh, caused by the postpartum lower back pain had a noticeable association with uh, pelvic floor dysfunction according to our research findings. So, we would like to uh, say the disability caused by the postpartum lower back pain had a, low, uh, had a noticeable association with uh, pelvic floor dysfunction in three to six months postpartum women attending to MOH clinics in Sri Jayavadanapura Municipal Council area. Hence, it is recommended that pelvic floor dysfunction following childbirth should not should be treated with appropriate treatments without neglecting it as a minor issue as it, as it can obviously cause uh, lower back pain and other disabilities later in their lives. Raising awareness about this topic, particularly this topic among uh, pregnant women and as well as in healthcare professionals is also crucial. These are my references. And I would like to uh, make this an opportunity to uh, remind all the participants who actually participated in this uh, research. And uh, I would like also like to uh, thank the staff of MOH Clinics and Sri Jayavadanapur Municipal Council area. And last but not the least, our supervisors for the continuous guidance uh, they gave throughout the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have a hypothesis about the 
how your back pain is associated with pelvic floor dysfunction. And I can make a video. What is your life? Yeah, uh, there are certain researchers as well. Uh, so they suggest that uh, certain uh, researchers suggest that pelvic floor dysfunction actually causes lower back pain in postpartum women. But there are certain other researchers suggest vice versa. So uh, in our uh, study, we can really check if lower back pain, postpartum lower back pain, has an association with uh, pelvic floor dysfunction in postpartum women. Uh, not the ergonomics, we didn't consider the ergonomics, madam. 
uh, but we uh, considered about the parity and the baby's birth weight and also the type of delivery. Especially things like breastfeeding, the foster such as 
age, gender, uh, etc. And uh, uh, part B, some uh, close-ended work profile-related questions like uh, kind of dentistry, the methods they are using, and uh, some uh, physical activity. Then the part C is the standardized uh, Nordic muscular questionnaire, um, which uh, we uh, use to collect the prevalence. Then the, uh, we have distributed the consent form for the, the dentist and uh, instruction sheet, information sheet, and we have distributed uh, the dis um, questionnaires among dentists by ourselves and collected it personally. And if there were any queries, uh, we are also explained them well. Then about the sample and data analysis, uh, we use uh, non probability convenience sampling. And then we have entered all the uh, data into Excel sheet first and then into a uh, SPSS version um, software. Then um, uh, we use some descriptive test and uh, further we have some uh, we have done some cross tabulation uh, to assess the um, some associated factors. So uh, moving to this result, the mean height, rate and age of the respondent were like this uh, respectively. And the total working hours per week were uh, 45.81 plus or minus 12.33. The and the majority of them were like 64.1 uh, were females and 35.9 were male. Then from that, 81.3% uh, of the participants recorded pain and discomfort at least uh, one part of their body in the last 12 months. Uh, whereas 18.8% um, had no such pain during uh, previous 12 months. So you can see the table here. Then moving to my second results. Uh, this is the distribution of prevalence of WMS according to the specific part of the body. So uh, for the this distribution you can see uh, the highest influence for, is for the neck area, it's uh, 54.7 followed by the lower back area 46.9 and the shoulders 41.4. Then the least common areas to develop WMSD like we found uh, the hips, elbows followed by the ankle. Then um, moving to some associated factors, the majority of the participants were female and from that females 85.4% of them has reported any pain while the males uh, the least participant uh, only report 73.9. Uh, then the association, uh, the kind of dentistry and the WMSD, so according to our data, among the participants, uh, only 4.7% use uh, dentists used to uh, use timing dentistry only and 44.4% pack, uh, practice in sitting position while 50.8% or the majority uh, used to practice both being standing and sitting. And from that, uh, the standing, those who use standing only, they have reported 100% or the all of them presented uh, complaints, uh, any pain or discomfort. While uh, 72, only 72.3 from those who use both uh, complain about any pain. Then moving to the usage of magnification and visualization A, uh, that we have found that um, majority of the data professionals, like uh, 69.7% were not using any magnification or visualization aid, though uh, only 30.3% used to uh, use some of these aids. Like uh, from them, uh, the, those who, like you can see here, those who are not using any visualization aid uh, reported uh, uh, any pain or discomfort in like 81.2. Then the um, physical activity status. Uh, According to our data, only 36.9 of the participants were involved in some kind of physical activity, uh, while most of them do not uh, um, uh, exercise, do regularly. Then, as you can see here also, those who do not exercise regularly uh, show some um, pain, uh, while those who do not, uh, while those who uh, do exercise regularly shows less pain. Then, um, moving to my next discussion. WMS were high among female compared to male. Uh, this is this uh, results were aligned with this uh, research done in UK uh, in 2013, and the majority of the participants reported pain and discomfort in at least one part of the body. And the other uh, these most common areas affected are neck, followed by lower back pain, while the least common areas were hip. Then the major associated factors perceived by these dentists were the gender, kind of dentistry, lack of physical activity, and lack of uh, taking multiple 
during procedures and the lack of use of magnification and visualization aid. So our results are really aligned with this uh, research done in India in 2020 using 151 participants um, using two questionnaires on the topic of occupational related MSD disorders among data students. Um, but the results they found are high comparatively to us as example they have reported 66.7% uh, neck pain while we only uh, got 44.7% uh, uh, so uh, in, my, in conclusion there is a high prevalence of WMSD among dental, uh, dental professionals uh, in Columbia district and the most prone areas given of WMSD are neck and lower back followed by shoulders the main associated factors for WMSD among dentists are gender, uh, age, gender, kind of dentistry, lack of physical activities, and the lack of use of magnification agents and visualization aids. Uh, and we have found that the psychosocial factors can also be a cause for WMSD among dental professionals. So these are my references. And acknowledgement, the authors gratefully acknowledge the director and the deputy director of National Dental Hospital, Sri Lanka, and Institute of Oral Health, Maharadu, for accommodating with the distribution of the questionnaires. And special appreciation goes to all the dental professionals of uh, National Dental Hospital, Sri Lanka, and Institute of Oral Health, Maharadu, for uh, participating voluntarily in our data collection and the great uh, assistance they provide. And our gratitude goes to the Department of Physiotherapy for the guidance and the support provided all the time. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for that interesting presentation. Um, I think this is probably related to other professionals as well, like the ENE surgeons and they basically will be the adopted in hostels. Um, did you look at the, the dental chairs and the things they use? Was there any difference between the, the, the particular? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, we only focused on the prevalence, so we just used the question, yes, and we didn't go for that. But that may have some kind of a yeah. yeah, we can. Uh, so if we did uh, it during the COVID situation also, so they don't like us to come near, like, so that was also that. Associated factors among dentists are age and the 
So, uh, did you do a subgroup analysis? Uh, 
we could able to get ethical clearance from the ERC KDU and our study was a cross-sectional study and the study sample of the physiotherapist working in the state hospital and uh, clinics in the western province and we included physiotherapists with more than one year experiences and we excluded physiotherapists uh, who have not given their consent to the participation and who are working only in the private sector and who are on long term view and who are in pregnancy period. So finally we uh, delivered an online questionnaire for them. So this is our result, which was analyzed by the SPSS version 21. So this is our demographic data. 52% uh, of uh, participants were the male and 48% were the female. So in this analysis, we mainly focused for the professional and social impact. In the professional impact, we mainly focused for the uh, safety precautions and the difficulties with safety precautions and uh, duty changes during the pandemic and treatment delivery methods and uh, the vaccination uh, vaccination procedure. So in this pie uh, chart, you can see in the blue color area, uh, the most of uh, physiotherapists are getting uh, sufficient amount of uh, protective materials during the pandemic. So in figure 2 you can see the most popular popular, uh, popular protective measures. 13% uh, of physiotherapists were using uh, three ply mask and uh, hand gloves and hand sanitizers and 12% of physiotherapists were using uh, N95 mask, N95 masks and um, aprons. Then 10% of physiotherapists were using uh, N95 mask and then 8% of physiotherapists were using um, shoes and uh, less amount of physiotherapists were using safety goggles. Then according to figure 3, you can see the difficulties with protective measures. 27% um, of physiotherapists were having uh, excessive uh, sweating with using this uh, safety uh, precautions. Then 23% um, uh, of physiotherapists were having communication difficulty. And 21% of physiotherapists are having breathing difficulty, and 19% of physiotherapists are having uh, difficulty with wearing and removing those equipment, and 7% uh, of physiotherapists were having skin irritation, and less amount of physiotherapists were having uh, the difficulty with handling patients. So according to, the, according to the figure 4, we can see the special training for the COVID-19. Uh, we can see in blue color area, uh, the most of physiotherapists uh, had not received uh, special training for COVID-19. Only 38.8% of physiotherapists were got uh, special training for the COVID-19. So in this figure 5, in this bar chart, I have included the professional impact of COVID-19. So 42.8% of physiotherapists had to face uh, the patient reduction during their clinics and 10.6% of physiotherapists were compelled to work and 15% of physiotherapists had improved their online consultation and 19.3% of physiotherapists had to refrain from their private practices and 0.8% of physiotherapists had to resign from their jobs and 17% of physiotherapists had duty changes. So in here, in this pie chart, I have included the, uh, uh, some, uh, included the results regarding vaccination. Uh, you can see in this uh, blue color area, 97.7% uh, of physiotherapists had received the vaccination and among them, 68% uh, of physiotherapists had side effects from this vaccine. So let's move on to the social impact of COVID-19. 15.8% uh, of physiotherapists got positive for the COVID-19 and 45.5% of physiotherapists, uh, their relatives were positive for the COVID-19 and 30% of physiotherapists experienced the loss of their family members and 10.3% of physiotherapists had high uh, workload distress and 24.7% of physiotherapists had high living costs and luckily 
uh, 60.5% Ejophysiotherapist had social support also and 14.6% uh, Ejophysiotherapist had uh, limited time to spend with their families. So here in table 1 I have included uh, chi-square test results and correlation values of professional and social impact between the uh, during pandemic and before pandemic. So as a conclusion I can say uh, there is a correlation between the, uh, with those categorical groups between before pandemic and during pandemic. So those are the categorical groups, number of working days, number of hours working, uh, number of, uh, working hours per day, uh, number, night shifts per month, traveling more, and traveling experiences, traveling time. So there is, there is a correlation between those categorical groups between before pandemic and during pandemic. So in table 2, also we can see the correlation. Uh, in here we can see the relationship between the sufficient materials and getting COVID-19 positive and then relationship between special training and getting COVID-19 positive, then uh, relationship between the duty schedule and during, uh, getting COVID-19 positive, and the relationship between the treated COVID-19 patient and getting COVID-19 positive, and the relationship between the vaccination and getting COVID-19 positive. So as a conclusion, I can say there is no any correlation between, uh, with, uh, between those categorical groups with getting COVID-19 positive. So this is our discussion. Uh, according to our results, we could found uh, similar articles. Uh, one article uh, which was conducted by Dr. Meen in 2020 in Portugal. Uh, there were similar results, especially in the protective measures. And in 2021 in USA, there were also similar results, especially in the uh, training for COVID-19 for physiotherapists. And via Sanchez in 2021 in New Australia, there were also similar results, especially in the online consultation during the pandemic in physiotherapists. And Kimberly J. Haynes and Southbury in uh, 2020 in Hamaba, there were also similar results. Uh, in the social impact of COVID-19 for physiotherapists. And also we could found uh, one um, negative resource in Asian country, uh, which was conducted by Muhammad Aslal and Safar in 2022, uh, which was vaccine hesitancy among Pakistan physiotherapists. So this is our conclusion. Uh, COVID-19 has changed the social life and professional life routine of physiotherapists. So this is our recommendation. Uh, we would like to recommend to extend our study, study for the, all the physiotherapists in the Sri Lanka and the, all the healthcare workers in the Sri Lanka and also physical, mental and economical aspect of life of physiotherapists during the pandemic. So these are our references. So finally I would like to express uh, my gratitude for the participants of this study and the team, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, staff of Department of Physiotherapy, and my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, the paper is now open for discussion. We have got three minutes questions. Thank you for your interesting presentation. I just, I mean, uh, I just want to know, like, uh, about your questionnaire. So you have developed that questionnaire, right? So did you uh, take, um, I mean, uh, uh, did you refer the questionnaires used by those countries that you have mentioned in uh, the discussion? Thank you, madam. Uh, yes, madam. Uh, we, we got this questionnaire from the uh, researcher uh, from which was conducted in Portugal uh -huh. uh, by the event. So uh, how did you validate it? Uh, validate it because you mentioned that you have done the validation. Can you explain how the validation was yeah. done? We did uh, some modification uh, with our uh, senior professionals and uh, we gave uh, our uh, questionnaire uh, for the 20 physiotherapists apart from the Western province. And according to the data, we. Uh, Modify it. Modify our question. Okay, thank you. Okay.
Thank you, Madam. Please remain on stage again. Now, I would like to invite the Dean of Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, Surgeon Captain Ayanti Pereira, accompanied by Mr. Chamdi Senevidakna, the Head of Department, Department of Physiotherapy, to present to Mr. Shani Rodri the token of appreciation. Thank you again for joining us today.